Okay, that was a well-timed wall in conversation. So I'm going to seize it and get started. So, as I said a few minutes ago, the story picks up with Mary rushing off to see Elizabeth. Well, why does she go in haste? Well, Luke doesn't say why, of course, but Mary is certainly not visibly pregnant at this time. So she doesn't need to rush to avoid rumor and scandal. She probably goes as quickly as possible just to see Elizabeth. Remember, Elizabeth's pregnancy is the sign that God gave Mary as proof that if he could bring life to a barren womb, he could bring life to her untested womb as well. So naturally, she wants to see this sign for herself. Also, to kind of borrow language from our 21st century, I can imagine that after her experience, she might need some processing time in a safe place where she can reflect on all that has happened and will happen. And she will be in good company with Elizabeth, who also hid herself away for five months after her miracle. So Mary arrives at the household of Zechariah and Elizabeth, and she greets Elizabeth. And at the sound of her voice, the pre-born baby John performs a little prophetic leap inside of his mother's womb. And just as her baby is filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and she pronounces a blessing on Mary and on the fruit of her womb. That's in verse 42. And did you notice how Elizabeth uses the word fruit? And that, of course, recalls all the blessings of creation. So ever since the garden, God's faithful people have always counted babies as a blessing. The ability to be fruitful and multiply was a part of the Eden blessing from the beginning of time. And so now, especially in a cursed world, a baby is a sign of God's continued blessing. Well, both the spirit-empowered baby and the spirit-empowered mother recognize the presence of the Lord and King within the womb of Mary. And we know this from verse 43, where Elizabeth calls Mary the mother of her Lord. She knows, and she probably knows, through special revelation from the Holy Spirit. And what a blessing this is for Mary. Mary doesn't have to explain her situation. It is already known and rejoiced over. Elizabeth has accepted her pregnancy without question. In fact, she is overjoyed. She is overjoyed to see Mary, and she honors her because God has shown her such favor. Well, in verse 45, Elizabeth also blesses Mary because of her faith. She says, Blessed is she who believed there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. So is Elizabeth comparing Mary with Zechariah here? Undoubtedly. Zechariah should have set the example of faith. He has the position of authority by birth. He is a priest and leader in Israel. He has benefited from years of instructions of, from his spiritual forebears, and now he is elderly, and one would presume wise and mature in the faith. And yet, it is the poor, and by contrast, the ignorant, young woman who sets the example of faith. And again, we see, even in this, just a small hint of the pattern of exalting the humble and humbling the proud. Because for the last six to seven months, Zechariah has not been able to speak to Elizabeth. And from this account, it actually appears he may not even be able to hear Elizabeth. But here is Mary, her voice freely calling out her greeting and interacting with Elizabeth. She passed her test. Her faith is commendable. And Elizabeth blesses her for it. Well, Mary isn't just blessed by Elizabeth's words. She is blessed by her presence. I mean, what a blessing it is anytime an older, mature woman encourages faith in a younger woman. But for Mary especially, what a joy it must have been to have a faithful older woman who has also had a miracle performed in her womb embrace and encourage and bless her. So Elizabeth's arms and her home are a sweet respite for the young Mary. There is an unusual fellowship of joy and peace at this moment. God has looked on them both. He has performed a miracle in each of their wounds. He has marked these two as key players in his story of the ages. And there is a sweet understanding between them and a deep connection forged through the favor God has shown them both. 
Well, in Elizabeth's excitement, we can see that she is already experiencing the joy and gladness that Gabriel prophesied about to Zechariah back in verse 14. And her delight and joy affects Mary. I think Elizabeth's blessing and her encouragement prompts that beautiful hymn of praise that the mother of our Lord speaks, beginning in verse 46. She begins, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Mary's hymn is what we call the Magnificat, and it beautifully reveals Mary's heart of faith, but it does something else. It gives us a good understanding of what faithful Judeans expected from their King of Glory. Now, when Mary speaks, she is likely also filled with the Holy Spirit here. Remember, the Holy Spirit was going to come upon her at the virgin conception of Jesus, and he has probably remained with her since then. So her hymn divides into three parts. First, there's the first part where she speaks of God's personal blessing on her. The second portion, where she speaks of God's national blessing on Israel. And third, she speaks of God's faithfulness to keep his promises. So let's look at the first part. This is in verses 48 and 49. Here she recognizes that the powerful and mighty God has exalted her, his humble servant, so that now all generations to come will call her blessed, just as Elizabeth has just done. And she's right. Here we are, over 2,000 years later, and we are still speaking about the favor God showed Mary. But also, Mary speaks of the pattern of God's story in her life. She has observed this pattern in the old stories, and she is now experiencing it for herself. Humility before exaltation. So Mary delights that the holy and mighty God has stooped to do this great thing for her, a humble servant, unworthy of his notice. Well, she then transitions to the second verse of her hymn in verse 50, where she acknowledges that God has shown and will show this kind of personal intention and favor to all those who fear him across every generation. Well, in the second part, verses 51 and 53, Mary shows now that what God has done for her on the personal level, he will now do for Israel on the national level. He will exalt the humble. Remember, Israel has been in spiritual exile in her homeland, and even now she is in political exile under the rule of a Gentile and pagan nation. So Rome is the current enemy in a long history of oppressive enemies. Rome, those words proud, mighty, and rich describe Israel's enemies. So Israel has experienced constant humiliation by their proud, mighty, and rich enemies. And it is their own fault, of course. Their humiliation has happened because of their rebellion against God. But still, historically, they have been an oppressed people. But notice how she contrasts the proud, the proud mighty, and rich enemies with the poor and hungry. Those descriptions are just a nod to the continued judgment of God on Israel. They are not fruitful right now. They are not enjoying the blessings of Eden. They suffer want and need. Instead of ruling, they are ruled. Instead of having abundance, they are poor. Instead of being satisfied, they are hungry. But Mary knows that through the miracle of this baby in her womb, her nation's fortunes will be reversed. And in verse 52, she imagines the toppling of the Roman Empire and the demise of King Herod because her son will be born to crush Israel's enemies. He will take David's throne and restore the nation to greatness. So she imagines, she looks forward to the exaltation of her humble nation. Now they are poor and hungry, but through Jesus, they will once more be filled. We see that in verse 53. Jesus will bring back the abundance of Eden, and he will give them relief from the curse on the ground, and he will give them rest from their enemies. Well, in the final section of her hymn, in verses 54 and 55, she looks back into Israel's history. She looks back even further than David. She goes all the way back to where God called Israel his servant, when he brought them out of Egypt 1,500 years prior to this. 
And then she goes back another 400 years before that, all the way to Abraham, the father of their nation. So she has traced what God has done for her back to its root over 2,000 years into the past, all the way back to Genesis 12. She sees that God's callings on Israel and his promises to them find their fulfillment in the fruit of her womb. So she knows what we know. She knows that all the ancient prophecies have led us to her, to this moment in time when the life of the Holy Son of God and human child who will crush the snake is cradled in her womb. God has been faithful. And for that, Mary rejoices and she magnifies his name with her hymn. Well, Mary stays with Elizabeth until Elizabeth is about ready to give birth, and then she returns to Nazareth. She's probably three or four, four months pregnant by this time when she leaves, but she's young, and this is her first pregnancy, so she can probably conceal her thickening waistline with clothing, but not for long. For now, though, the story stays with Elizabeth because this is her shining moment. In her old age, she gives birth to a baby boy, and her neighbors are delighted for her. They recognize that God has shown her mercy, and they rejoice with her. It's another beautiful moment. We've had a few of these in Luke 1. We find so many reasons to hope at the beginning of our sequel. Faithful Judeans, they recognize when God is working, and they rejoice. And they obediently follow the traditions of Moses. So on the eighth day, they arrive for John's circumcision, the sign that they are still keeping the covenant with Abraham. But during the traditional ceremony, Elizabeth surprises everybody by departing from tradition. The friends and neighbors call this baby his father's name. But in verse 60, Elizabeth corrects them. She says, no, he shall be called John. And then there's really kind of a comic exchange here. Her friends argue with her. No, that's not a family name, as if she doesn't know this. And they don't take her word for it, so they go to Zechariah, who not only can't speak, but doesn't appear to hear them. So they're making signs to him, trying to say, your wife is going to name him John. What? He should be named Zechariah. But he communicates that he wants a writing tablet, which they bring to him, and he emphatically writes, his name is John. He doesn't say, he shall be called John. No, it's his name is John. Like it, Almost like he's already had that name for a few months. Because, of course, he has. God has already named him. Well, immediately, when Zechariah shows his faith by obediently naming his son John, his sign and his judgment is taken away. His tongue is liberated, and the very first thing he does with his newly liberated voice is bless the Lord. Now there is so much filling of the Holy Spirit in Luke 1. It's like a little preview of the day of Pentecost went for Israel, when the Spirit comes and fills everyone who believes. It's like the day of salvation for the Gentiles, when the Spirit will just indiscriminately fill anyone and everyone who turns away from their sins to Jesus. Well, we get a small taste of that filling here in Luke 1. The pre-born babies are filled with the Spirit, their mothers are filled with the Spirit, and now Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. And like Mary, Zechariah speaks a hymn. Mary had her Magnificat, and Zechariah has his Benedictus. As a priest and seasoned leader of the people, Zechariah's blessing is much more detailed than Mary's. And he inverts her order in the hymn. He begins with the national picture before funneling down into the personal. So four observations about his Benedictus. First, he rejoices because he knows that the birth of John means God is finally returning to Israel. Like Mary, Zechariah sees what has happened in his family as a fulfillment of the promises God made throughout the Old Testament. We can see that in his language in verse 69, where he speaks of the house of David. In verse 70, he talks about the mouth of the holy prophets of old. We see it again in verse 73, when he speaks of the oath that God swore to their father Abraham. So Zechariah clearly links what is happening in his family 
to the fulfillment of all those ancient prophecies. Second, also like Mary, Zechariah recognizes John's, John's birth means that God will redeem Israel from her enemies. So we see that in verse 71 where he says that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hands of all who hate us. He says something similar in verse 74. But third, unlike Mary, Zechariah adds nuance to God's promise to redeem them from their enemies. He says God will redeem Israel from their enemies for a purpose. Look at verses 74 and 75. God will save them from their enemies so they might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So Zechariah acknowledges that Israel's role from the earliest of days was to serve God. Remember in Exodus 9-1, God told Pharaoh, let my people go so they may serve me. And then in Exodus 19-6, he tells the people of Israel at Mount Sinai that they should be to him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Priests are God's servants. They mediate between God and man. That was Israel's mission. And Zechariah looks forward to Israel's restoration so that they can now accomplish their mission. Fourth, Zechariah shifts from the national to the personal when he speaks directly to his son in verse 76. Here he prophesies about what John's future ministry will be. So in verse 76, he says that, John, you will be the prophet who goes before the Lord to prepare his ways. And I hope you're immediately reminded of Malachi 3.1, where God says, I, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then in verse 77, Zechariah speaks more specifically of John's mission. He will be the prophet to go before the Lord in order to give knowledge of salvation to his people through the forgiveness of their sins. Here, Zechariah has been reflecting on Malachi 4.6. Remember, this said that the Elijah-like prophet will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Turning is repentance, and to repent is to be forgiven. So John's ministry is preaching repentance and forgiveness which is the way of salvation. Zechariah then prophesies about the effect of John's ministry. Israel will repent. God will forgive their sins. And then he will return to them. In verse 78, look what he says. The sunrise shall visit them from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So here, I, mean, I hope you hear echoes swirling around in your head of a bunch of prophecies we've already read this fall. Because Zechariah just kind of conflates multiple Old Testament prophecies about what the King of Glory will do when he comes. So there's an allusion to Malachi 4.2, which says, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. There are echoes of Isaiah 9 2, which says, The people walked in darkness, the people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. But we also remember Isaiah 9 7, which speaks of the increase of the king's government and of the peace he will bring. And then finally, there are whispers of Micah 5 4 and 5 which prophesies again of the peace the king of glory will bring them. It says, And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. So as you can tell, Zechariah has not been idle in his silence. He has been schooled by the sign God gave him, and he has not stubbornly hardened his heart. Instead, he has responded with faith and now with rejoicing. His Benedictus has all the marks of several months' worth of meditating on the Old Testament prophecies. He believes God's words, and he rejoices in them. And so all the rest of us who have ever doubted God's promises can take heart. You may falter for a moment, but God, through the power of his word, can restore your faith. 
Well, the reaction to all the, the reaction to all these events in verse 65 is that fear came on all the people who had gathered for the circumcision ceremony. Fear because they recognized that God was in their midst. It was God who was behind this miraculous birth. God was behind the sign of Zechariah's muteness and behind his miraculous recovery and now behind his prophecy. But why fear? Well, anytime sinful humans sense God's presence, they tremble. Remember how they respond to seeing an angel? Well, the effect is magnified with God because God is holy and powerful and we are sinful and weak. But this isn't a fear that drives them away from God because they leave that day pondering all they had seen and heard. They leave and tell other people what they had seen. And all over the hill country of Judea, people begin to wonder, what is God going to do? What will this child be? They are eager to see what God will do through this miraculous baby, miracle baby. Well, Luke closes his first chapter with a one-sentence summary of John's entire childhood in verse 80. And we'll get a similar sentence about Jesus' childhood in the next chapter. But let's look at what he says about John in verse 80. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. So even in that one sentence, Luke makes two allusions to Old Testament prophets. So back in Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah prophesied of a voice which would cry, In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So this alludes to a pro another prophecy about the Elijah prophet. But also with the word wilderness, we have to remember Elijah himself, who fled for his life from Queen Jezebel into the wilderness. This was in 1 Kings 19, and here God miraculously sustains him and encouraged him before setting him out on another mission, this time to anoint a new king of Israel to replace the wicked Ahab. So you can see Luke, he expertly sets the stage here for the birth of Jesus. It is full of hope and anticipation. It recalls the ancient prophecies, and it records the voices of faithful Jews who have been waiting and watching many long years for this very moment. Are they ready? Are they prepared for their king? Well, did you notice which prophecies were missing from Mary's Magnificat and Zechariah's Benedictus? Neither of them made any mention of Psalm 110 and the eternal priest from the line of Melchizedek. Neither made any mention of Isaiah 49 or 53 and the suffering servant who would be crushed for their sins. We already know that they don't yet understand that Psalm 110 prophesied of a delay between the exaltation of their king and the crushing of all his enemies on the day of the Lord. Israel, understandably so, is very focused on their national identity as God's people. They are focused on their continued oppression at the hands of their pagan enemies. And having repented of their idolatry, they think they can just clean up their own hearts enough. They think they can keep God's covenant well enough, well enough, so that God will return to them in the old way, where he blessed them by living among them in his temple, and when the Levitical priests atoned for their sins with animal sacrifices, and when a king from David's line gave them rest from their enemies and made their nation great. They want what they had for a short time with David and Solomon. But God has something so much better. But they are going to be very surprised by what that is. Because even faithful Jews couldn't quite understand that sin, not Rome, was their biggest enemy. Although they have been watching and they have been living the story, they've seen the pattern time and time again of all the Eden reboots toppling, but they still hadn't learned 
that they could never be good enough for God to return to them. Even now, they don't realize that until their biggest enemy, sin, is crushed, all Eden reboots will topple. But God knows this. So in Jesus, he is sending his king priest not to crush Rome and liberate the nation from political exile, but to crush sin and to liberate his people from spiritual exile. And the challenge for Joseph and Mary and for Zechariah and Elizabeth and even for John is to prepare room for this king who will surprise them time and time again. Well, you know the story. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, fulfilling the prophecies of old. He grew and began his public ministry in which he powerfully exercised his divine dominion over the curse by healing diseases, multiplying food, even reversing death. He exercised his divine dominion over the spiritual powers by silencing demons and casting them out. He exercised his divine dominion over nature by calming storms and walking on the sea. He spoke with the authority of God his Father, but the words he spoke confounded the crowds that stalked him. They wanted more miraculous signs that he was indeed the Messiah, and plenty of signs he gave them, but his message turned them away. Jesus spoke of dying and of eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He spoke of the coming eternal kingdom as beginning as a mustard seed and a buried treasure. He spent time with sinners, people who weren't keeping the law. He touched lepers and diseased people. He was from such humble origins. The son of a carpenter? <laughs> this is not the king for us. Even his mother and his own brothers expressed some skepticism about Jesus. At times they thought he had lost his mind. Even John will question his messianic identity. But do you know who will rearrange their lives and prepare him room? A Roman soldier? A Canaanite woman? A Samaritan adulteress? Jewish traitors who work for Rome? Prostitutes? the formerly demon-possessed, and all other kinds of disreputables, the ones who know just how enslaved to sin they are. It's the ones who have been trying to keep the law who will struggle the most to make room for this king. Well, by and large, the people of Israel rejected Jesus, just as they had the prophets of old. They didn't like his words, they didn't like his claims, and so they plotted his execution, unwittingly performing the very deed that would save many of their souls from their worst enemy. By nailing Jesus to a cross, they ignorantly fulfilled the ancient prophecies about the suffering servant who would pour out his life as an offering for them. By crucifying Jesus, they made him king. The placing of a crown of thorns on his head was a gross parody of the glorious re reception Jesus received when he ascended into heaven's throne room <clears throat> to be crowned by his father. Israel killed the king of glory, and they killed him in the most humiliating and excruciating way, by hanging him on a cross, the punishment reserved for the very worst of criminals. And his mother and his followers despaired that all hopes for a restored Israel were lost forever. But then, in the biggest reversal of the curse yet, this man who had never sinned, God raised from the dead, forever crushing the power of sin and the curse of death. At the cross of Jesus, and at his empty tomb, a new mass exodus took place. As God redeemed his people, not from Egypt, not from Babylon, and not from Rome, but from the dark domain of the snake. And all those who humble themselves at the foot of his bloody cross and call on the name of King Jesus, God now frees from slavery to sin and from the curse of death. 
You see, you and I and our children and our car mechanics and the clerks at Target and that pedestrian crossing the road when you're driving, we're all in the story. We are all in this same story. We all have a role to play. And whether or not we are villains or heroes depends on if we have made room for this king. If you have prepared him room, then you are redeemed, like Zechariah said, for mission. If you have prepared room for this king, you are his servant. And this is our mission, 1 Peter 2.19, to be a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That's why Jesus came to call sinners out of darkness and into the light of his kingdom. And the will of God, which prospered in his capable hands, now prospers in the hands of his servants, as we do his work of calling more and more sinners out of darkness. So remember that mission that started all the way back in the Garden of Eden? God wanted to spread the beauty of his creation to every corner of the earth and then fill it with his blessed image bearers? That is still the mission. Where Adam and Eve failed, where Israel failed, Jesus has been fruitful. And now he calls his church, a collection of Jews and Gentiles alike from all over the world to complete the mission. And he has given us everything we need to do it. He has given us clean hearts so that sin no longer derails the plan. He has given us his spirit. As his glory filled the tabernacle so many years ago in the wilderness, his spirit now fills his purified people on earth so that we can carry on the mission in the presence of God. And he has given us the promise of fruitfulness. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now there are still enemies. The snake still deceives many. His offspring persecute God's people. And there is still a curse on the ground. Those enemies won't be finally crushed until Jesus returns to claim his people and to redeem all his creation. While he waits to return, his kingdom is growing. So what began as a mustard seed with the work of his people will spread into every corner of the earth. Jesus reigns. He will come return to crush his enemies. He will reverse the curse and redeem all of creation. But for now, he waits. And we wait. We wait here in this cursed world, which is only the land of our sojournings. Like Israel, we are only passing through this wilderness onto the promised land. And in the wilderness, we will walk the same path that Jesus walked. There will be suffering and humiliation, but then exaltation, when we are raised in glory just as Jesus was raised. Humility before exaltation, that is the pattern. It was Israel's story, it was David's experience, it was the king's path, and so it will be ours. But it is a path we don't walk alone. We have the countless voices of the heroes of old calling out to us, believe the promises, be faithful. We have the footsteps of Jesus to follow in. We have his spirit empowering us at every step. And we have each other to help one another on to God. The promised land and all the blessings of Eden are ours. If we in faith will humble ourselves and turn in repentance to this King of glory, he is coming again. Prepare him room. <laughs>